In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, the one who loved us and sent his Son for us, we thank you for your kindness and your mercy and your great invitation to draw closer to you. I thank you, dear Lord, for providing everything for our spirits and our bodies, for providing us a family here where we can grow together in you. I ask for your spirit to open our minds and our hearts and explain to us your desire and your will for our lives. Bless all the activities in the church right now and hear us when we, your children, gather around you, hoping to hear from you when, you sit, when we say with one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Okay, everyone has Bible in one hand and coffee in the other. We're ready? Good. Today, I don't have a PowerPoint. I just wanted us to open the Bible and read the Bible together and just kind of go straight to the Word of God. And you know what? There's no rule against bringing a paper Bible. In some countries, you're not allowed to walk around with a paper Bible, but in this country, it is allowed. So I encourage you, when you come to a Bible study, to bring a Bible. I know it sounds crazy, but we're going to go radical. We're going to go radical, and we're just going to try and bring your own Bibles to church. Make it a habit. And ladies, there's tables here, too. You, can, you won't spill your coffee on your dresses. It'll be, come sit here. Come sit close. Bring your Bibles, and I want everyone to participate. I know it's been a while since we've had a meeting. At the end of the year, uh, Peter gave a talk. Do you guys remember what the talk was about? I know you do, but you just don't want to say it. So it's the tree that didn't bear fruit for three years. And at the end of the year, we oftentimes think like after three years, it was cut down for not bearing fruit. That's a very common talk at the end of the year. But since we talked about the tree that doesn't bear fruit last time, I said, why don't we talk about the tree that does bear fruit so that this year is different? Don't we all want to be fruit-bearing trees, fruit-bearing branches? And so I think that's actually Christ's desire for us as well. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted us to read John 15, verses 1 to 9. We're just going to kind of read the whole parable And then we'll go through it. But do you guys know the setting of this parable? John 15, this is his discourse with the disciples on the night of his crucifixion. So John John 14, 15, 16 are kind of his last teachings. Some of his last teachings he gives to the disciple on that night. And it's amazing that one big chunk is this passage. And so let's take it with that in mind because what's going to be happening to him? He's going to be taken away. His disciples have been with him for three years and he's going to be taken away. He doesn't want them to be concerned. He wants them to remain faithful and remain strong in him. So let's read in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. I am the true vine. My Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and they throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. 
And as the Father loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. I think there's a very deep spiritual mystery in here, and I think it should be almost the source of our pursuit, our spiritual pursuit, that if we can figure out this mystery, our lives could be totally changed. And so, on the night of his passion, he's giving us a visual example so that we could remember. There's three main characters in this passage. There is the vine, which is who? Who's the vine in this passage? Jesus Christ is the vine. There are the branches, and who are the branches? We. Who's the third character? The Father. What does the Father do? He's the vine dresser. So we're going to discuss those three, but I want you to think about, of all the things Christ said, Christ invited us to different things. He said, come to me, all you who are heavy, laden, and burdened, and I will give you rest. That's a great invitation, but this invitation might be the greatest. He says, abide in me, and I will abide in you. This is an awesome invitation, but it's conditional. He says, I will dwell in you. I have no doubt of his ability to dwell in us, to abide in us. But sometimes I wonder if he's concerned about our desire to dwell in him. Are we abiding in him? So he says, even though I'm going to be taken away, don't give up. The word abide has several meanings. You know, you know what we call the place that you live in, we call it your abode. That's your abode. What do you do in where you abode? You abide. <laughs> you abide in your abode, right? And so to get an idea, that's where you dwell, that's where you live, and that's where you remain. So the word abide has those three meanings, to abide, to dwell, to remain. So Christ is saying, if you remain in me, if you live in me, I will live in you. At that time, <clears throat> there was no concept of God living inside of anyone. God was always far away. And then when Jesus Christ came, he was God among us. But then he says, now I'm going to be inside of you. For them, that was, I think, a difficult thing for them to understand until Pentecost. But you understand it now. And does it mean anything to you that Christ is saying, I want to remain in you? I want to live in you. You are my home. Does that have any value to you as a Christian? Because it brings with it tremendous unity, tremendous blessing, fruitfulness, as opposed to the unfruitfulness that we talked about at the end of the year. And it involves this God's life working in you. And I think the reason why we are unfruitful is because this lack of abiding and of him working in us. So of the three characters, what does a vine do? It grows, but what does it do for this, this whole tree? What does the vine do? Actually, the vine doesn't bear the fruit. What bears the fruit? The branches, the vine doesn't. So the vine needs the branches to bear the fruit. The branches need the vine. What does the vine do for the branch? Yes, it's rooted in the ground. It, perform, it forms a great foundation, but also it grabs the nutrients. Everything that the branch needs comes through the vine. I want us to understand that part that the fruitfulness of the branch depends on the connection to the vine. What does the vine dresser do? We're going to get into that. So yeah, he, he's in charge of... The vine dresser is the one who actually plants the vine. Why does he plant the vine? To bear fruit. So the vine dresser, his whole purpose of the vine... And the branches, this whole endeavor is to produce fruit. And what is the purpose of the branch? We'll get into that. So in the verse verse, he says, I am the true vine. 
Why does he have to say true? Absolutely. And also because in the past, the Jewish people had failed. If you go to Isaiah 5, um, I have a confession. We're going to be flipping today. So be prepared to flip in your Bible. Isaiah chapter 5. They moved it to the Old Testament, so it's kind of like more towards the middle. Okay, Isaiah chapter 5. He talks about a vine. And he says... Sorry. So in chapter 5, verse uh, 7. No, sorry, verse 5. He says this. Sorry, verse 4. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? So Isaiah 5, 4. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Meaning the vine dresser. Okay. I did everything. Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste, and it shall be pruned or dug. It shall not be pruned, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will command the clouds and that they not rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel." So this was a very prominent idea in their minds, and there was a vineyard and a vine and a vine dresser, but it wasn't producing fruit. So he says, listen, you guys were doing it wrong. He says, I am the true vine. So if you're going to be a branch, you need to be attached to the vine. But the question is this, what if I said there are lots of vines, but there's only one true vine? Many of us are attaching our lives, our interests, our efforts into some other vine we think that is going to satisfy us and give us the fruit that's going to make our lives amazing. For a lot of us, it's our jobs. We think this job or this investment is going to change our lives. A lot of us, actually, it is our family. We spend all our efforts in our family and and not that you shouldn't, don't, don't neglect, forgive me, do not neglect your families, that's not the purpose. But sometimes our only focus, our main focus is the family. And we think if we just take, everything will be fine. Yet we're still neglecting the one true vine that produces fruit. And so ultimately we needed to shift our focus to the vine. There will be fruit in the family. There could be fruit in the job and in relationships, but ultimately Attaching to the vine is the source of the success. So he says, I am the true vine. Where are we? This is important. This is a reflection for you. Where do you find yourself attached the most to? What consumes your thoughts? What makes you more upset and happy than anything? Is it Jesus Christ, the true vine? Are we spending our money, our time, our efforts, our thoughts on the true vine or something else? That's something only you can decide because the ultimate success of the branch depends on abiding in the true vine. So then he says something amazing. He says, my father is the vine dresser. That's an amazing privilege. How many of you have had bad gardeners? In California, there are a lot. I can give you all their numbers. <laughs> I've had lots of them. What do they do? They just come and they just cut. They just cut. They don't understand the plants. They don't understand the needs. They don't understand what it needs to be fruitful. They just cut. But you have the ultimate vine dresser. His desire is fruit. And he knows. And why, you know what he does? He examines each branch. He knows the needs of that branch. Does this branch need more water? Does it need more fertilizer? Does it need more sun? Does it need to be in a different environment? When you plant like a cactus in a place where there's a ton of rain or you plant a sequoia tree in a plant where it's desert, it's the wrong environment. So what's amazing about the vine dresser is that he knows you. He searches you. He knows your weaknesses 
He knows what needs to be remodeled. He knows what needs more attention. And you know what else comes around the vine that prevents them from being fruitful? Thorns? Absolutely. Yes, with the pruning, we'll talk about that, but also insects and pests. And so it's amazing our vine dresser knows how to keep away the pests. He knows how to defeat the pests. Actually, he's trampled on the head of the ultimate pest. And so now you think about, I want to be fruitful, and I have someone that's always trying to prevent me from fruitful. The vine dresser can take care of it. If you put your life in the hands of the ultimate vine dresser, and say, I want to be a fruitful vine for you. But then he says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that does not bear fruit. What is the, so you almost like, if this one's not producing fruit, get rid of it. So wait, what does that make you think the purpose of the branch is? What's the purpose of the branch? It produces fruit. Does it do anything else? The branch is removed if it doesn't remove fruit. God expects fruit in our lives, and he is very upset at things that don't produce fruit, like the parable that Peter talked to us about, the tree that was given three years, and it didn't produce fruit, so it was removed. When Christ was, in during the Holy Week, and he sees a fig tree, looks beautiful, it looks like it's great, but it missed one thing. It didn't have fruit. And it was cursed. So the only purpose of the branch is to produce fruit. What kind of fruit? What's a good fruit? Who's the fruit for? For the vine dresser. If he plants a grapevine and it produces grapefruit, oh man, I'm, for me, I'm cutting that out. Like I don't want grapefruits. I want the fruit that pleases me. So now your only purpose in the vine is to produce fruit that will please the Father. What do you think those kind of fruits are? What are the kind of fruits that will please the Father? Because this is the main purpose of the branch, to produce the fruit that pleases the Father. That's your only purpose in being a branch. So how did you become a branch? When did you become attached to the vine? When you were baptized and you received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what connects the branch to the vine. Without the Holy Spirit, there's no connection. And there's no fruit. So, let's talk about the fruit. If you think about it, what are the kind of fruit that would be pleasing to the Father? Fruits of the Spirit. Now, the question about the fruits of the Spirit. Do you produce the fruits of the Spirit? The Holy Spirit produces the fruits in you. You don't always have control of that. Virtues, yes. You have to labor. But are there other fruits? What if you had virtues, but there's something that you didn't have and it would be distasteful to Him? Love. Ultimately, the most pleasing fruit, and we're going to talk about this, the most pleasing fruit is love. If you had all the virtues, if you read 1 Corinthians 13, if you had faith to move mountains and you give all your stuff to the poor and you give your body to be burned, but you don't have love, you are nothing. So now he's Christ on the night where he had just washed the disciples' feet and said, love one another as I have loved you, and he's about to be crucified for them he says you need to have fruit pleasing to the Father. It's not just emotional love, but also love for all of God's children, which are believing in Him and those which are not. Everyone on the planet, God desires that how many people should be lost? Not one. God desires that not a single one should be lost, but that everyone should turn and repent and be saved. That would be the most pleasing fruit. For those of you who have multiple children, some of you have like villages, but like the multiple children, if let's say you've got three and one of them goes far away 
And the other two, like, well, mom, dad, you know, we're still here. Like, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not content until you go bring me the other one. And I will, I'm, I love you, but and if one of them is lost, it breaks your heart, right? It's the same with God. So this is a fruit he desires, that we should bring everyone to him to build his kingdom. This is the fruit that pleases him. So what is the consequence? Actually, before I get to the consequence, he takes it away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Pruning. There's another word for pruning. Cleanses. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Wait a minute. Every branch that bears fruit. Not the ones that don't bear fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. So those are good branches, right? Why do you have to prune it? So it can produce more. And he keeps saying more fruit over and over in this passage. He's happy with fruit, but he's not happy with some fruit. He wants more. So never be content with what you're doing. Let your past be your past. We look forward to God producing more fruit. But then it requires pruning. What do they use for pruning? Nice, soft, you know, uh, suede things to just massage the branch. Oh, no, no. Oh, no, they use sharp cutting tools. Sharp cutting tools in order to produce more fruit. And you are the branch. Sharp cutting tools that will allow you to produce more fruit. So if you think about it, is that a... It's sometimes fun for the gardener, but for the branch... Doesn't seem fun, but it, what if it produces more fruit? So there's a there's a verse in Hebrews 4:12. It's there's a very sharp cutting tool. Hebrews 4:12. I want you to look up Hebrews 4:12. is the pruning tool oftentimes Christ uses. You say, well, the Bible isn't doing that for me. I don't feel like it's cleansing me. I don't feel like I'm being pruned. I have to be honest. Just by owning the pruning tool, it doesn't work. Like if the gardener has the, the big scissors, that doesn't mean everything is pruned. Okay? What has to happen? It has to penetrate through the vine. Okay? So a lot of times we have heard the Bible... And it might go as far as our lips. We might talk about it. Sometimes we read the Bible and it goes as far as our eyes, but it doesn't make it to our mind. Or it might make it to our mind, but it never makes it to the heart, where the heart is the decision maker and the will. If the, the pruning tool, the word of God, the sword, never makes it to the heart and to the will and the decision making, then it doesn't work. And so... Then we have to ask ourselves, we're given the same pruning tool. We all have this word of God. How does it cleanse? You have to let it penetrate. You have to stand under it. So a lot of time we read it because it's your quiet time, your morning ritual. and so, Oh, I read it. Oh, that was very nice. Thank you, God. But it never went deep to what do I need to do to be changed? Or actually forget, say, what do I need to do to be changed? This is the tool. So you say, God, work in me what you just taught me. Use this to prune my heart. You want to know the most important, some of the most important things. When someone is fruitful, you want to know what prevents them from producing more fruit? More fruit? Pride. Pride is probably one of the most important things. Someone might have a little bit of success, like, I got this, God, thank you very much. You walk off, and guess what? Cut, <laughs> you're, you're gone. <laughs> you need to be humble. So oftentimes, God humbles us, and this is where it kind of hurts. 
because our pride is so powerful in our lives and it's ruling and we, it's all about us and our attention and how we feel and I want everyone to look at me and I think I'm so good. Cut. That's exactly what he needs to do. And so if he is humbling you, that's part of the pruning process. It's actually a good thing because without it, there's no more fruit. It hurts, but it's actually necessary. Not only is it important to have humility, but what else prevents us from producing fruit? Abuna talked about it in the sermon today. A lack of unity, divisions, and a lack of forgiveness. Those three things are very deleterious, very harmful for your life. You're like, I'm not producing fruit. Well, God says you need to not have this anger or this hatred. That, that, I'm sorry, that doesn't work. Don't expect to be fruitful, but this is like the main characteristic, the main part of the fruit I want, and you're not allowing it to happen. You're, you're letting in the thorns, but you're not letting in the fruit. So I do think we do need to allow the Bible not to be a routine, just a thing that we carry, but it needs to go deep. In Colossians 3.16, he says, Let the word of God dwell in you richly. What is the word dwell in? Is there another word for dwell in? Abide. Let the word of God abide in you richly. Meaning what? That if someone were to visit your house, where do you put them? Oh, thank you. You're going to sleep in the garage tonight. You give the guest, a great guest, the best place. The word of God for it to dwell in you richly needs to have a higher honor. And he's going to say, and the words which I've given to you, are, you are being cleansed by the words that I'm speaking to you. Christ was seeing them changed. Now one of the things that, how come the words that the apostles were hearing was changing them but not us sometimes? Because when they heard Christ speak, it was to them. Christ is saying, you know, unless you deny yourself and carry your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Oh, okay, highlight, circle, look up Greek references. No. They're like, oh, wait, that's me. I take it personally, and if I want to be a disciple, I have to do those things. That's the difference between their fruitfulness and ours from them being clean. That these words are directed to you. And these are how we are pruned if we let them prune us. Okay, that's extremely important for us. Okay. Now, he says in verse 4, Abide in me and I in you. So, if you don't, you can't bear fruit. This is the life oftentimes we know. This is what Peter was talking about in that other parable. In Luke 5, when Jesus Christ first calls Peter, Peter had been toiling all night. He had caught nothing, and he's washing his nets. Nothing. Could you imagine going to work? Oh, sorry, you're not going to get paid today. Oh, sorry, you, you made this effort with your kid. No, 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 you're not getting anything out of it. What was the problem? He was toiling all night. And without him, without, when Christ said, hey, I want you to go back into the deep, what happened? His boat was overloaded and was about to sink. Okay, there's another time after the resurrection. They had forgotten about Christ. And then Christ says, hey, move your nets to the other side of the boat. And they caught a ton of fish. So their own efforts were producing nothing. But once Christ was blessing it, Christ was supplying the source of the fruit, it was an abundance. It was an abundance. And the problem is, is that we're not letting Christ produce the fruit. So I want you to look at Colossians 1.29. Small little four chapter book. Ephesians, Philippians, Thessalonians, Colossians. Okay. 
At the end of chapter 1, he says this verse, which blows me away. It says, To this end, this is St. Paul saying, To this end I labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. St. Paul is probably the most fruitful servant after Jesus Christ in the history of Christianity. How is he striving? He says, I'm striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. So was it St. Paul's labors? Yes, but it was the work of God inside of him. If you go to, now we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 and 9. You guys have probably heard these verses. But they always come back, and this is a source of our fruitfulness. This is how we can be most fruitful when we have this mentality. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 9 says this, And lest I should be exalted above measures by the abundance of the revelations, thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. So St. Paul was seeing visions of heaven. St. Paul was fruitful. Then he was given a thorn in the flesh. In our passage, we could say that was part of the pruning that was part of the cleansing process. Because then he says this. And he said to me, My grace is... ...do for someone every time. You're, but you're not letting God work in it. Ultimately, we make our own efforts, and you might see little fruits. You want to see amazing fruit? You need to say, God, work in me. Let it be your power. Let it be your blessing. Let it be your grace working in me. Every time you have to uh, go visit someone, give a talk, give a presentation, uh, do, say, God, like you have a difficult situation with your child, God, let it be you working in me to resolve this situation, whether it be with your child or your spouse. Dear God, you resolve this. And then you will see that he is now working within you. And just like St. Paul says, he, I labor with his working effectively in me. His working effectively in me. And so I'm not saying don't try. Your labors are necessary. But God's are the ones that produce the fruit. So how often are we relying on God to solve our issues? To bless everything in our lives. We're oftentimes saying, well, I'm going to do this new discipline plan. I have a new uh, self-help book, audio book I'm going to listen to, and I'm going to go to the gym. That never works. We know that. Diet, eh, it might help too. But we do all these things on our own. And the last person we're including is God to produce the fruit. So he says, abide in me and I in you. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. So how do we do the abiding? That's the whole crux of the situation. If you figure out the abiding, he will abide in you and then you'll be fruitful. So how do we do the abiding? Well, I got to be honest. Um, Gospel of John uses it about 15 times. Uh, first epistle of John uses it about 15 times that word abide. There are lots of ways, but let's just look in this chapter, 15.7. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask that what you desire and it shall be done for you. If my words are abiding in you. What is the reward of his words abiding in you? And what you ask, you will ask what you desire. The difference is you're like, I pray for things all the time. Our hearts are not always aligned with him. His words are not always correcting us and guiding us so that our hearts are like his. So when you're requesting things from God, you're requesting the things that God desires as well. Then no wonder he gives it to those people because the words are the one that are inspiring their prayers. So part of it is the word of God. That's a very critical part. But in verse 9, as the Father loved me, I have loved you. As the Father loved the Son, I loved you. And I want you to remain in this love. Holy cow. Is that a hard thing to remain in the love of God? 
Is it so hard to remain in God's love for His love to dwell in you? I want you to go to Ephesians 3. I think it's verse 18. I love this verse. Yeah. Ephesians 3, verses I'll do 17 to 19. He says that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Instead of dwell in, what can we say? That Christ may abide in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and grounded. That sounds almost like vines and branches. Rooted and grounded in love. And that you would be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes all understanding which passes all knowledge. It's the greatest kind of love you will ever know or could ever imagine. He says, I want you to remain in that love. Anyone not want to remain in that love? If you dive deep into it, I want you to really study. God demonstrated his love for us in Romans 5, 8, that while we were sinners, he died for us. Oh my gosh. Like if you just go and look at the, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son his love is unbelievable it's unbelievable and if you start to study his love it will not be hard for you to remain in his love and sooner or later i gotta be honest it's probably going to grow outside of you it's going to come out of every pore of your body you're going to be speaking breathing teaching love so he says remain in my love and i will abide in you So it's through his word and through love. Also in John 14, 6, this one, you just got to turn one page or scroll to the left. All right. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Wait, hold on. That's not it. 14. Huh? No, no, that's not the one I wanted. There's one about, um, about obeying the word of God. He says, in verse 22, sorry, in verse 23, John 14, he says, Jesus answered and said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who keeps my word. If you're not going to obey the commandments, but if you do, he and the father will dwell in you. Again, I think maybe Peter and I may, might even start uh, a series on abiding. The idea of abiding is incredible, and the fruits of it are wonderful. But then he says this, a branch that does not bear fruit, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire. So what happens to the branch that's not producing fruit? The one that's producing fruit, he's pruning. The one that's not producing fruit, they cast it out. Well, what happens when the branch is removed from the vine? It withers. It dries up. Many of us have seen and have experienced and are personally living right now in the withered up stage. We feel dried up. We don't feel the vitality, the life of Christ flowing through us And we're saying, dear God, I want that. I remember when I was in college. You know when you're in college, you think you're very philosophical, right? I was just sitting, uh, looking at, reading a book, and I looked at a tree, tree in front of me. And there there was a recent storm, so all these leaves were on the floor, except for one. One leaf held on to one branch. As long as that leaf held on to the branch, guess what? It was going to live. It was going to receive from the branch. It was going to receive from the trunk. It was going to receive life. The moment it gets even partially cut, it's not much further to cut the rest. But the fact that it remained, it was abiding, it was dwelling and holding on to the branch. My question is, do we have the fight in us? Do we have such a desire that I want to remain in the word of God? I want to remain in his love. I want to remain in him. I don't want ever to be cast out, taken away as an unfruitful branch. I'm tired of the withered up life. Some of us have been living the withered up life for years. I have a secret. 
our vine dresser is able to graft you back in again. He does that. If you read about it in Romans, he talks about grafting into the original tree. God can take the withered branch, put it back in the tree, and give it life. You're not lost in this situation. He can restore you. But you have to desire to abide. The word of God, the love of God, and the spirit of God working in you. In the Orthodox Church, we believe you can do nothing good for God without the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12, 3, it says, anyone who has the Spirit of God does not call Jesus Christ a curse. And you cannot say Jesus Christ is Lord without the Holy Spirit. That's the most basic thing to say Jesus Christ is Lord for a Christian. It says without the Holy Spirit, you wouldn't do that. So we depend on the Holy Spirit working in us. Now, I want to say uh, one or two more things. So the idea of the branch for being withered and cast out, I want you to plead, say, I want to re be restored. I want to be grafted back in. I want to receive you working in me. I want to receive that joy. I want to receive that peace, that love, that power, that connection to you, to my brothers and sisters, and connection to heaven. I want that again. Please restore me. Lead me. Prune me. Show me how. But it is through the Spirit of God and the church. So beg the Spirit to restore you. Beg the Spirit to restore you back into the vine that God would be flowing in you. And let's say you are a branch, not you're still drying, but you're still attached. Still ask for the Spirit to bring back life in you, to rejuvenate you, to bring forth the fruit. It may require pruning, but it requires the Spirit of God for sure. One more thing. I'm not a gardener. I'm not really good at telling the difference between a branch and a vine. You want to know why? They look alike. Eventually, a good branch that produces fruit looks just like the vine. I want you to read in Romans 8.29. Some of you, Romans 8.29, some of you, 2 Corinthians 3.18. But I think it's really important for us to understand this is the beauty of the abiding. In Romans 8.29, it says this, and in, for whom he... Sorry. For whom he foreknew, he predestined. He predestined to be what? Conformed to the image of his son. Our purpose on this planet is to be conformed to the image of his son. That I, let's go to 2 Corinthians real quick, 3.18. I love this verse, and um, it kind of reveals to us a bit of the process. Okay, it says in verse 18, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, or being more and more fruitful, being more and more like Him. It says, but by what? As by the Spirit of the Lord. You want to know how you can tell if a branch is abiding in the vine? because it begins to look like the vine. Are we appearing to be like Jesus Christ to others? I remember back when I was in college, there was this whole what would Jesus do movement. And we all had the bracelets and, and I was realizing, you know, what would Jesus do is actually still relevant because the more you begin to pray, God, show me what you would do, you'll begin to act like he would act. So one of the things about the abiding is that he changes you to look like the vine. How amazing would this church be? You know, and in the dome of churches, it says, I'm looking down on the vineyard which my hand has planted. And so we are the vineyard of God that he's planting, and it would be amazing if all the branches in this vine look like him. Let's focus on the word of God, the love of God, and the Spirit of God flowing in us. I want, forget what I want, He wants us to be fruitful. 
May God reward you, and I pray that this word will penetrate. And I always want you to bring your Bibles. Okay? Let's stand and pray. Why doesn't everyone just take a moment to think about whether or not we are in a withered state or a fruitful state? I also want everyone to take a moment to think about which vine do you find yourself planted in? Are you planted in the true vine? Or are there other false vines not producing fruits in your life? Maybe we need to be removed from those vines and planted in the true vine. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our dear Master and our dear Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who loved us and gave himself for us, I thank you so much for giving us this example on the night of your passion when you wanted us to remain in you, even though you were going to be taken away on a cross. I thank you, dear Lord, not only for this invitation for us to remain in you, but this greater opportunity for you to live in us. I pray, dear Lord, that you would help us to open our hearts, open our minds, open our lives, that you would find a comfortable, welcoming home there. I pray, dear Lord, that day by day, from glory to glory, your spirit would work in us, change us, dear Lord. Help us. We're tired of being withered and dried. We want to be fruitful. We want to be a fruitful vine, honoring you, glorifying you, that the purpose of our lives would be mainly just to focus on honoring and glorifying you. And you said that you told us these words, that our joy would be full. Help us, O oh Lord, to receive this joy that comes directly and only from you. I ask for your grace upon this group standing here. I pray, dear Lord, that you would work a mighty work in our hearts and in our minds. Lead us unto you and unite us to you and to each other by your spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray through intercession of our beloved St. Mary and all your saints who are part of the vine and have been fruitful. Hear us when we say with one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever and ever. Amen.